Hello, I am Margie Engel, and hopefully I am going to teach you how to do bodacious embellished applique. Bodacious because it's bright, it's bold, it's embellished, and it's embellished in different methods. So I hope that you enjoy this, this entire system. You, can, you have too many options here, but we'll work those out with you. The first thing that I think I should do is explain to you the difference in this method of applique and what you might perhaps have been accustomed to doing because there are some differences. Difference number one, the major difference is we work on one sheet of fabric like this throughout the entire process and until we're really happy with that applique, we don't cut it out of here. That's major difference number one. Major difference number two is that we are going to embellish with colored pencils, we're going to embellish with some thread painting, and then the last thing we're going to do is sew it down to a background. So that's the overview, and then we will get into, right now I'm going to hop into a supply list so that you'll know what you need to be able to do this with us. Now, you will be able to download a supply list that is accurately written for you, and hopefully everything's on there. But I do have them spread out, and in session one, I'm going to explain them to you, and then use them throughout the sessions, and you'll never have to worry, I don't have to worry about going back and being too terribly detailed. Obviously, when you're doing applique, the first thing you need is a design. Designs come from all places. I don't have to tell you, you can get them out of coloring books from your own photographs and from quill books, of course, that you purchase. Supply number two, obviously, fabric. Lots of fun fabric. Number three, and this is another difference in bodacious applique, this is fusible interfacing. Do not confuse this. Later, we're going to need fusible web but don't confuse fusible interfacing with fusible web. You know fusible web, fusible interfacing, if you have ever made a shirt like this or a jacket. It's from the garment industry and it is in these lapels, okay? Third thing we, or whatever number we are, the next thing we need is some kind of stabilizer. This happens to be a water-soluble stabilizer you can also use medium weight tear away, where it's quite well, use your favorite, because you'll be using a lot of it. But the reason that I like the water soluble is probably obvious. You can pick up your applique, you can run it under water, it will flash under there, and it dissolves, so it makes life easy. One of the more important things that you'll be using is colored pencils. Now, you do want to make very, very sure that you do not use colored watercolor pencils. Why? Because watercolor pencils are water soluble and they will wash out at the inkling of any, anything. These are clay-based uh, clay based pencils. Uh, this particular brand puts out many, many kinds of colored pencils, but these are clay-based. It's the only ones I've seen across the entire United States that are readily available. So if you find these are good. When you use colored pencils, you want to use the little handheld marker. There are two kinds here. And you want to make very sure that you have one or the other and you're not putting these precious colored pencils into this this one pops off in the sharpeners in here. I should have told you that. It's just like a lipstick tube for women. It makes it easy for us to remember. But you want to make sure you do not put these through a regular electric or the handheld sharpeners because they will eat your pencils and you don't want to do that. Obviously, you're going to use thread and we're going to talk more about threads in, in another session. We can't applique without threads, and we certainly can't embellish without threads, so we'll talk a lot about it in the future. An option that will come in handy for you is hoops. You may use them, and quite possibly you may decide you don't want to use them, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about them because then you'd miss a whole loop in here. We're going to later on talk about 
Quilters Press Bars because I'm going to show you how to make easy stems and leaves that will go on your actual applique. These are all in the, in the sewing process, we are going to be using certain kind of machine feet. Oh, what a lovely shot we have here. Look what the cameraman has done for us. You can see how well they are, and if you will notice, open toe feet. See the open toe here and the open toe here? Those are so much better than the closed toe that you might be seeing here. Open toe simply means that you have clear visibility right through here and right through here when you're stitching. And the people who have trouble with special stitching, their problem is that they can't see their stitches. So this way you have clear visibility and it's easy. It's worth the investment if you're going to do applique to go to your machine dealer and say, I need open toe applique feet and open toe motion, uh, free motion feet. The last thing we're going to talk about, and here they are, it's called what, got what I call free fruit. Laces and buttons and beads, and we're going to talk about this later, and it's a great addition on Bodacious Applique. So there you have the basic supply needs, and in session two, we're going to get at it and start with step one and just move right into this. Margie Ingle here again with session two of Bodacious Embellished Applique, the most fun applique you'll ever get to do. Now we're going to dive right into step number one because we have a lot of different things that we can do. And I wanted to first talk to you about fabrics because so many people say, what can you use for applique? Well, the most honest answer is you can use anything your heart desires and that's the good news. What do I use and what do I tell beginners to use? 100% cotton. And I think most quilters know that. You can use batiks, you can use plaids, you can use ginghams. But you see behind me and you see here that I really have stuck with some pretty basic things. Now, this is marbled fabric. The reason I like marbled fabric is that I have true control over this. I can darken areas that I want darker, and I can lighten areas that I want lighter. So that's the true advantage to the marble fabric. So you can't quite do that quite as easily with batiks, but you can with marbled fabrics. Another reminder, we are going to still be working on squares of fabric. It's still, that. remember, it's a different kind of, of uh, applique. Okay, the first thing you do is you, of course, go pick your applique fabric. And I haven't said a word about background fabric. We're not going to worry about that. Pick what you want to do. You want to do yellow flower, do yellow flower. You want to do a purple monkey, do a purple monkey. Uh, you want to do a red parrot, we'll show you later, do a red parrot. You find your design, and you, pretty generally the designs are simple enough that you can place them beneath this fabric, and I have done that. You can see. Step number one is I put it beneath the fabric and so that you can see it, I have traced the major portions of this particular flower with a permanent pen. It's a hard line and later, if I were really using this, I would cut that hard line away. But generally speaking, I use these nice soft colored pencils and then I never have to worry about taking these soft colored pencils away. You can see them, actually you can see them quite well here, and you can see there are so many light spots in here, and you can see that I have darkened the center of the flower. The, again, the colored pencils we talked about using, we're going to use colored pencils that are clay-based. You take your fabric, lay your fabric down, and then start laying colored pencils on top of that fabric to pick your colored pencils. Pick several hues. Notice the variety here. Pick several hues. I may not use all of this, but I'm looking for some dramatic darks, and I am looking to have some variations in value so that I can put shadows and dimensions on my one piece of fabric. 
So step number one, select several colored pencils, as few as three, as many as five, and they will work. But get some darks in there and get some variation, treating your fabric as a medium value fabric. All right, that's number one. We've picked our fabric, we've picked our design, and we have picked our colored pencils. So we're going to go to work with colored pencils. Step number one with the colored pencil you've seen on the wall behind me. You are going to actually draw the outline, and I, these are done in halves. So you're going to draw the outline with the colored pencils, and you can see very nicely in here that if you follow the contour of the petal with medium color colored pencils, these are a little darker so that you can see them on the camera. The middle is vacant, I'll tell you why later and you can proceed to shade as much as you want or as little as you want using the middle colored these pencils and later on you can take whiter pencils or lighter colors and then at the end start adding lighter things if you want it to be darker in here take your colored pencil and shade it in a little bit darker here if you look at the one over here we have moved from this to this and you see we have laid in some more darks so that you can actually see too a lot of white around here some of that's going to be cut away but you see this medium i colored that darker with a medium color because the center of it is darker and you don't need to worry about shadows it's always 12 o'clock somewhere so it's going to be 12 o'clock on our flower so i know that the back petal is the darkest petal and i'm going to let that be the darkest petal down here and you know that the throat of a flower is always the darkest section of the flower. Incidentally, the lily is one of the easiest uh, flowers to do because you're not doing such a dramatic um, center on here. But that's often the most dramatic in any flower. If you have petals that are leaped over, you'll put some dark lines on these petals. And then once you're happy, this is something that you do as much as you want to do or as little as you want to do. And once you're happy with that, then we'll move into the other steps. But I want to show you the other thing that once I've got, I told you that there was a reason why we had an empty middle section. And you can see this is all colored pencil work, right? All right, now we're going to drop this down and look at the next step in the colored pencils. And you can still see it's all still colored pencils, but it's quite a bit different because look what, ha what has happened in the center of the flower. We have made it very dramatic. We've changed it. Uh, this happens to be a gazania, so I took a photograph and said, oh, this is what a gazania center looks like, and I drew these in. You might want to go to a marker to do some of this and bring up some dark markers. A lot of you are very familiar with this. Another marker, the, some of the other markers have two points. This has two points on it. So you have a fine point and a medium point. And you can take either one and dot shadows into here. And it's a very effective way to be able to get a dramatic flower. Another good use that we use, and this is, will be in the book that I will show you later, is that you can make faux applique. And if you really want to be honest, you can call it fake applique. Um, this is not applique, this is colored pencil, and I drew in the border. All of these little flowers are just simply drawn in here with colored pencil. You can use colored pencil, you can use markers, whichever way you like. And here you have a very easy way to do a nice border on a quilt without the trouble of sewing it down. Of course, it's not hard to sew down, but you have it without any trouble. We've embellished this. You can add anything you want. We are going to talk about embellishment. One more thing you need to know about using colored pencils and markers is that when you're working on dark items, if you have dark colors to add to dark items like this, sometimes dark colored pencils or markers don't show up as well. So the thing you want to do is underline it and you underline with a white pencil, or you can get all-purpose white ink, underline that, then take the color that you want, put it on top, and you will be amazed at how well you've done. So that's step one, embellishing with colored pencils, as much or as little as you want to do, and just enjoy yourself as if you were a five-year-old child again.
Hello again, Margie Engel here with Bodacious Embellished Applique. And then this session we are going to talk about some really fun things to do with our machines because after all this has been, is and has been and will be machine applique, which is not, you could do it by hand, but we all do it by machine. So this whole thing is geared for machine work. Number one thing though is you must know your, your sewing machine. Make friends with your sewing machine. Give it a, you know, give it a name, talk to it, love it, enjoy it. If you hate your machine, go find another one. Uh, machines don't have to be terribly expensive if you don't want them to be. Get the best that you can afford and ask, ask around because the, when you buy a sewing machine, you're buying two things. You are buying a sewing machine and you are buying service. And that word service becomes very important if you want to keep your machine a long time. And today we do. We like them. They're our friends. Number one thing, though, you have to do, and it's up to you, is you have to keep that sewing machine clean. So when you go and get that wonderful sewing machine, or even when you drag it out of the closet, learn how to take off that top slide case and learn how to brush out the dust, brush out the lint, vacuum it if you want to vacuum it, uh, if you want to shoot air into it, all repairmen have different stories on this. Talk to yours. Keep it clean is the bottom line. And then number two, if your machine dealer tells you oil your machine, do it. Oil it. Most times they will tell you in the vertical bobbin case machines, they will tell you to put a drop, a drop, one drop of oil in the bobbin case so that it runs smoothly. If you haven't put oil in and you normally do, your machine will start talking to you and you'll think, why does it sound like it's running a little bit roughshod? It's amazing. If it's running roughshod, open it up, clean it out, put the oil in there and it will love you because you have fed it lunch. The second part then uh, in handling machines is knowing what equipment to use and we talked about feet in the initial session and when you're doing applique, you can see so much better. I'm saying this again so you will understand that is, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to go put the money into an open toe applique foot and an open toe free motion foot. You will love yourself for doing that. You'll never hate the investment. It's a very good investment. Number three then on, on the uh, sewing machine that you need to know about is needles. Um, in the good old days, needles just came, universal needles came and you used them. Understand there are two elemental types of, machine, of needles. The first type is the kind we always used all our lives and that was the universal point needle. The universal point is rounded on the end so it is somewhat blunt and when it comes into the fabric, it pushes the fibers aside and penetrates it. What we really do better with here is something called a sharp needle. Sounds silly, but that's what they call them, sharps. The sizes of these needles also vary. And the larger the number of the needle, the larger the size hole it's going to make in the fabric. So it's going to have some interplay with the kind of thread you use as to what size you use. But you do want to use sharp needles. Now we also, the manufacturers want us to buy their products. We also can choose embroidery needles, um, metafill needles, jeans needles, a variety. The biggest thing you need to know is that if you are using metallic thread, you must use either a metallic needle or a top stitch needle. Because I'm lazy and because I don't like to keep taking needles in and out of my machine, I use top stitch needles. They cost a little bit more, but they last a lot longer. I don't have to keep changing them around and I do switch between one thread to another. Let's talk about threads for just a moment too because in today's world, if you think you're a fabriholic, wait till you start buying threads and you're going to go out of your mind at the choices we had. Choice number one that came along with the embroidery revolution, the, the machine embroidery revolution, was round threads. They give a beautiful, beautiful sheen and people like them. But you have to know that round threads don't have quite the life to them. Uh, they're not as sturdy, they will shred more easily, and if you use enzymatic 
things and you wash your quilts, then chances are good you will wash away some of the color. Consequently, the thread companies came up with this alternative and these threads that I use and that are shown here are polyester threads. You'll hear polyester, you'll hear trilobal polyester, you'll hear technical weights about them, and all you really have to concern yourself is, if I want to use polyester thread, is this the color I want to use? And don't worry too much about the other technical stuff. That's for the professional embroidery people to be concerned about. You can use cotton threads if you would like on your appliques, on your thread embellishment, and I'm putting down the appliques. Cotton threads are more matte in color. These are shiny, the, the polyesters are shiny, they have a sheen. The cotton threads are more matte, and at the same time, they will fill the hole a little bit better, and they're a heavier thread. So if, and, and they come in different weights. So if you want to use cotton thread, take a look at the weights. They come in 50, 40, 30, and 12. And this time, the smaller the number of thread, the thicker the thread. Go figure. Because with the needles, remember, the larger the number of the needle, the larger the hole that you get. So we're going to do some thread painting, and I want to show you about, uh, we talked about how we did all this coloring, and now I want you to think about free motion thread embellishment, and it's the same process. This is the one you saw before, the, uh, in the last session, you saw the, this done with colored pencil, and now I have done it again in the same sequence. I have started with a medium color, a medium hue, or value, Pick different, pick different values of threads, and then start using your medium values, and you can sew continuously throughout the flower. Start once and stop once. If you want to put lights, yes, add your lights the same way. You can see perhaps some lights over here. So I work with medium first, and then I work with light, and then the third step is I go into the dark threads and you can see the drama suddenly happens here. I will use fewer dark threads than I will medium and lights, but you can see that it makes it very dramatic, and then you can start adding in your details. If you are afraid of free motion, I would start out and practice a whole lot, and you can practice in all these borders. You can even try out your colored pencils in these little borders. You're going to cut them away later, but this gives you a, a wonderful place to play with and experiment on. If you're still not comfortable, you can use a machine guided stitch with an open toe foot and get the same result. Now I want to remind you behind here, we have pressed, on here we have pressed originally the fusible interfacing and that's what you're seeing on the back of this and we leave it on there. It's going to stay there the whole time, so it's on the back of all of this. In addition, I add either water-soluble facing, I'll move it up, I add either water-soluble facing or tear-away, and that is on the back, and I leave it on, and that wonderful, wonderful thing prevents you from having too many puckers, the dreaded, dreaded pucker, okay? Now, look at this, and you might say, and <clears throat> some people are really nice and they say, oh, I love it, finish it. But I want you to notice, and the camera guys are so good here, you're going to be able to see what is called shearing. See all this junk here? It's shearing and it's puckering. And at least when I came up in the, in the sewing world, I would have in my textiles classes not gotten a very good grade on this. And for me, it's just not appropriate. I want to see this smooth. So to be able to do it smooth, if the stabilizers that you have put on don't work, put on another stabilizer. If that's not enough, then go over and get a little hoop and hoop your fabric. These are really easy to use. These little, these, see these metal hoops and they pick up like that. Go ahead and use those hoops and they will, don't, don't pull your thread too tight, but they will guarantee you that you won't have the puckering that I showed you. So I want to show you now what happens when you have the difference and you come in and you look at this. This side is done step number one and two where I used just the light and the medium values of my thread. 
and to check that thread, pull that thread on, I'll show you that in a minute, pull your thread on your fabric to check it. But over here, you see what happens when you start adding dark thread. It can get very dramatic. Now I have two more points to show you, and one of them is right here when you're selecting your thread, instead of pulling your, putting your, your um, spool of thread up here to check your color, you know, do I want this color, do I want this color, do I want this one, pull them out as you see here, and that will give you a much more realistic effect that you're going to get because you're not doing solid embroidery here, you are doing embellishment. And there's a big difference in solid embroidery and this embellishment. Last thing, and it's an opportunity that you still have with your guided machines, and I bet some of you have sewing machines and you have 933 stitches on them and you've used five, right? So I want you to consider the fact that you can also embellish using the guided stitches on your machine and have a lot more fun that way. If you, you don't have to, but you can use them because you can see them built in here and you can use them in your applique. Now, you notice we're still working on a piece, one piece of fabric here. We haven't cut this thing out yet. But if you are totally satisfied with all the thread embellishment you have done and all the colored pencils, then now comes the fun. You get to cut this baby out and you wind up with a cutout applique. So that in the next segment, we'll show you what else you're going to add to this to embellish this even further and, and have a really bodacious applique. Margie Engel here again. Welcome back to session four. And we're going to talk about the finishing things that you add to appliques. Now that you have learned how to use colored pencil to embellish, use thread to embellish, keep your sewing machine clean, we're going to talk about added aspects because many, many flowers can float on their own, such as that but sometimes it's very nice to be able to add a stem to the flower. And I want you to understand that anytime you add any element to an applique, be it a stem, uh, a bug, a, a leaf, anything like that, you are directing eye movement on your composition. So it's an important feature. It's not just, oh, throw on a stem. That's not the point. Um, there are, you can curl stems and curly stems add a great deal as opposed to a straight stem. So I really want you to learn one method of making bias stems and I'm not going to tell you it's the only way to make a bias stem. It isn't. It's one way to make them. If you have a better way, remember it's your quilt and it's your methods. But I do want you to learn this simple method because it's just the one that I tend to use the most. To make a bias stem to go on your applique, first of all, you must determine the width of the stem. And if we were doing one for the flower behind me over here, this little white flower, we would probably want a one quarter inch stem. And the formula, you know, okay, I want a one quarter inch stem. How wide do I cut my strip of fabric? You take the width, this is the formula, the width of the stem, double it, in this case, we want one, qu one quarter inch. We double it to one half inch, and you add a half inch. That means I've taken one quarter inch, I've doubled it, I have a half inch. I'm going to add a half inch for the seam, and I'm going to cut a one inch strip of fabric. Now, I'm going to cut a bias strip of fabric. And if you're not, I think you're familiar, most of you, with bias, but let's make sure that you are. This is the straight of grain on, on fabric. If you cut your fabric salvage to salvage, or you cut the long way on the grain, you are cutting with the, the strongest grain of the fabric, and it's sturdy. You're accustomed to it being strong. And on this case, we want less, so we're going to the bias, which is somewhere in the middle of this fabric. And I can pull this and look at all the play it gives me. So bias gives us the opportunity to make curved stems. Here's how we do it. I have cut a one inch wide piece of bias and you can see that it kind of, it'll squinch out, it's kind of fun. 
And the first thing you do, and this is easy, you take that one inch piece of bias, you fold it in half, and you take it to the ironing board and you press it right sides out. We're not making a tube, we're making right sides out. Go to the machine and do your typical quilter's quarter inch seam. Now, if you're very, very frugal, you're going to say to yourself later, why did I make a quarter of an inch seam? Because you're going to cut it down. But make the quarter inch seam because your machine has a job to do and its feed dogs will move this along better. After you have made that quarter inch seam, yes, you're going to trim it and you're going to cut away. See this little squiggly here? We'll get it here in a second. This is kind of fun too, by the way. Just don't cut the stitching, but cut away that much of the seam and you're left with this little fine stitch. See, we've cut this away and you're left with this little fine stem. But you can see the stitches here and in applique, we wanna get rid of that. So you go to your handy dandy trusty bars. These are bias bars that I showed you in the beginning that were um, part of the supply list. Now, if you live in a very small town and you want to make your bias bars, that you want to make your stems that day, and you don't have a store, you run down to your local um, hardware store and you get strapping material because you're going to iron on this, and strapping material is a good substitute. So just keep that in mind. If those of you who have your grandmother's quilting press bars have metal press bars and they do burn your hands, and that is why they have switched to making plastic. Any of these will do and it works quite well. Now I'm going to take my press bar and I've cut this way and pretend I have cut this all the way off here, okay? Now you take your press bar and you slide your press bar into this, okay? And I'm going to get it up here. And that's why they make so many different sizes, by the way, to accommodate the size um, stem you're making. I'm going to take this to the ironing board and I am going to roll this stitching on the back. This is kind of small, but it works. I'm going to roll this on the back, put it down on my ironing board, and I'm going to start pressing that with my iron, and that stitching will, believe it or not, it'll stay back there and it behaves itself beautifully. If it doesn't, that's okay. Get some new language. You'll take care of it. And then you keep ironing and you keep pulling this along. You keep pulling along your fabric and you get the entire thing pressed and then you have one of these perfectly wonderful stems and then you can take it to your applique and use it any way that you like and you know in any any nice way you'll notice up here let's see if we can can get up here see the the angles on the stems these are not straight stems these are bias stems so that you can indeed shape them any way you like and obviously we've directed this into this flower and we've taken this this way and moved this this way. It just has a great deal more character than if I ran a straight stem and a straight stem. Now, if you want to do straight stems um, and that's the composition, of course you do straight stems. But in this instance, we want these curly stems. And so that is the result that you can get and it works out very nicely. Also, another important part of your composition is leaves, and I have put just a variety of leaves up here because leaves are not just plain leaves. Leaves can be made out of batiks and thread painted, as you've learned. They can be made out of two different fabrics, shiny fabrics. You can take the same fabric, you can run the different, different uh, colors of thread up here. And I, I just put the flower in here so you get the feel for this because you're making a composition here. But the leaf is an important part of this. If we didn't have neat leaves, then it wouldn't be as attractive of a piece. The last item I want to show you is how to make double appliques. And since so many of you are familiar with the fusible webs that we use so much in quilting, this will be a cinch for you. I want you to imagine that this is your favorite, favorite fusible web. Whatever brand you use, whatever type you use. We're going to make a double applique that, or a piece of fabric that is the same on both sides. It doesn't have to be the same fabric, it just happens these are, it's two-sided fabric is what I'm saying, okay? And the way you do that is very simple. You take the, this is a batik, but here's the right side, you know there's no, we're going to make a sandwich. 
you take one piece of fabric and whatever your favorite fusible is, you're going to put one layer, not two, not three, one layer of fusible. And then you take another piece of fabric. These are right sides out. It's a sandwich, right side out, right side out. Inside is my fusible web. You go to your ironing board and you start pressing in the middle, up and down, up and down, up and down, and press all this down until it's all stuck together. And the result is this one little piece of fabric like this. And from that, you can freely just pick it up, take your scissors, and start cutting out great shapes of leaves, great shapes of flowers, any kind of freeform items you want. The advantage to being able to use this is that you can cut out erose or spiny shapes. Now let me show you a quick example of the spiny. See how they stick out? I sew them down in the middle, so you don't need to worry about how you're going to sew them down. They last forever, but you can get interesting shapes on them. And they work out just really, really well for that. And in addition, these are the same things. There's no way to cut a dandelion leaf that sticky stick out. And little gidgets on flowers like this are the same, and the dandelion is the same. And on this quilt too, over here, the cat, the catnip and the clover, all of this was done with that method. And it's just a fun method, and there's no waste, because once you cut out one side here, it becomes the second side for the other leaf. If you don't feel you can freeform cut, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and draw on the fabric any kind of a design that you want with a pencil and then just simply cut it out and start sticking it up. Before long you'll be free motion, you'll just be free form cutting these out because it's too much fun. And since most quilters are women, they remember cutting out paper dolls. So it's just like cutting out paper dolls. You've done it a million times and you won't have a bit of trouble doing it again. So enjoy that. We will move into our next session and we're going to talk about what we're actually going to do then putting all this together and picking backgrounds. Hello again, and just in case you've forgotten, this is Margie Engel and we are doing bodacious embellished applique and you have learned, you've gone through steps of using colored pencils, stitching, you have made stems, you've learned how to do double applique and, and, or double your fabric. And now we're going to move on with the final elements of this. Still up to this point, you have been working with a single piece of fabric, unless you heard me say at the very end, last time I said, and the last step is that we cut this stuff out. Until now, you've had this. It's been stabilized, and that stabilizer has allowed you to do many things, but it's also protected everything. It's going to stay on there. So, the, uh, What I meant was, I made a mistake here, excuse me, fusible interfacing. It's going to stay on there. So that when you get ready, you're going to cut this piece out. And I've never talked about background fabric to you yet, because it wasn't necessary yet, and now it is. Once you cut this out, you have this wonderful, wonderful floppy piece of applique and it's all cut out and it's ready to be sewn to the background and you have made leaves perhaps and it's about ready to be sewed to the background. But you have to run to your closet, your fabric closet, and find some neat fabrics that you like and try out. I don't know if I'm going to do this really well for you. I guess I did. I want you to see the difference in what happens when you start trying out different fabrics for your backgrounds. And remember, try out, I'm on the wrong side, try out your, your uh, stems as well too on your, fa on your backgrounds. Run and pull out as many fabrics as you want. If you get as high as 10 fabrics, that's fine. If you can't make up your mind, call in the committee, call in your husband, ask the dog. But this is the same flower, and it's on two different backgrounds. And you can see they're very, very different. And you have to choose which of these is the best. And you're the quilt authority. You get to pick. It's your decision, all right? Often the way that I do this is that 
here, here for instance, I've gotten two pieces of fabric. I will actually take this and set this piece here and say, okay, is it going, at, is it going to show up better on the dark or is it going to show up on better on the light? And which one do I like better? Because after all, it's your quilt. You have to like it. Now, obviously, the light flower is not going to show up as well on a light background as it is if I start moving it over into this dark background. So if I were choosing between these two fabrics, you know, obviously, I would pick the dark fabric. Very simple. You've, you've got, and you notice these are all cut out, so you've got this thing all figured out. Once you've gotten to that point, then it is time to sew this baby down onto your background. And what you are going to get is something that's going to look like this. And everything that we talked about earlier about stitching, your machine, your open toe foot, your choice of needles, your choice of threads come into play. And then this is your finished product. You picked, obviously here, I picked, you've seen this quilt in the, in the first session. I picked the lighter one to show them all off because there were six of these flowers. But you can see now I've sewn down every facet of this. Use any stitch that you like to use. You can use decorative stitches from your machine. You can use straight, I've top stitched this. You can notice I've simply top stitched the um, stem, but you do see it's curved, don't you? It's not straight. And even the leaves, are, are, there's some veins showing in the middle. But this is all stitched down, and in this case, it's stitched down with a blanket stitch. You use what you want. If you like satin stitch, you use satin stitch. If you use, um, a, if your machine, all machines have blind hem stitches, use the blind hem stitch. If you want to use monofilament, that's fine. If you want to match the color of the flower or the edges, that's fine. This is your quilt, you can have fun. If you want to come up here and sew and break into this to add some more lines here, that's fine, do that too. It's one of these kind of things that anything goes. And once you have it done like this, you may feel that you are completely finished and happy, and if you are, that's fine. But if you want to move on into the wonderful, wonderful, amazing world of more embellishments, I only have one warning for you. We became fabric-aholics, we became thread-aholics, and now we're going to become bead-aholics. And the beading enthusiasts today, it's becoming so popular, and the beading enthusiasts will tell you that there is no end to beading. And if you notice the quilt behind me, right? It's sitting straight behind me. If you notice this gecko right here, she's beaded up the gazoo. She has all kinds of round donut beads on her. The little man below her is not beaded as much, but she is. And there is also additional building, beading throughout the quilt and on these flowers as well. Now, you don't have to do it, but it sure is a heck of a lot of fun. Now, you're going to ask me, do I do this by hand? Yes, I do. Um, I don't know any other way that I would be happy doing it. I do not glue beads. Some people do, but through my traditional heritage and through entering quilts in national shows, I have seen the judges go over and pull on the bead to see if it's been sewn down or glued down, and I don't trust glue. The amount of movement that our quilts get, I would much rather not glue a bead. So that's part of the fun of hand sewing, okay? Now, you have, you have a million choices of beads. I have set out a little bead container here to show you that if you start saving beads like these in these containers, go on and realize you're going to buy a dozen of these and you're going to keep on buying beads. It's half the fun. Buttons are another wonderful addition to start using in centers of flowers, and you saw them in one of the early quilts. And you can go to your stores and find this many packets where you can find so many buttons, or you can find really elaborate buttons. They'll knock your socks off. Then there's frou-frou. Frou-frou is all this other stuff that we add. If you had a flower and you wanted to add a bee, you'd cut this little bee off here, and you might cut five of them, you might put the whole family out. You cut these apart, they come in strings, and you place them wherever you want and sew them onto your quilt. You can buy rolls like this of marvelous flowers. See these great flowers? And they come on little rolls like this, or you can buy them by the yard, and they Again, you can cut them up, you can use them as they are, or you can cut them apart, and you can even put a bead in the center and it makes it, oh, it makes it wonderful. Rick Rack is back, ladies. 
you thought only your grandmother liked rickrack on your dresses, but rickracks, add them to your stems, run them down um, any place you want, and it adds just a lot of zest to a quilt. I have one caution for you when you are adding embellishments onto your quilts. A lot of the I'm trying to figure what word I should use here. It's an embellishment, but it's a braid or a lace. A lot of these that we get today are coming from overseas and they're absolutely gorgeous and they're wonderful to use. And this is metallic thread, so I wanted a metallic finish on this, okay? You have to be careful because this is literally wire thread. It used to be just a gold thread and now it's wire thread. When you're sewing this down, do not make the mistake of thinking you can plunk your foot down here and just zigzag this baby because the minute your needle hits one of these, it pulls that and it pulls the entire row. And if you're packing as I did yesterday, sometimes you'll pack it with a ruler or something and your ruler will snag and I thought, oh, I have to cut that off. And I thought, no, it's another good lesson for you. See how that's sticking out there. Now, what I will do to finish that off, I will not pull on that anymore, and I won't try to put it back. I'll just either cut it off and put a little bit of clear nail polish on there, or any finish that you like to use, you can put on there to finish that off. So that's kind of one of those cautions on these metallic threads. The other good option is you can always get a needle and thread and sew it by hand and sit down and watch television with your cat. Okay, we're going to move into the next session very soon. Hello for the last segment, segment six. I am Margie Engel. I surely hope you like a bodacious applique now. I love it, as you can tell. And what we're going to do is do a review using one of the more bodacious quilts that we have done, just to give you, a, again, a step-by-step -step run through. And if you have questions, you know you can ask them later. We'll have, it, we'll have an opportunity to do that. All right, where I begin with this particular quilt, of course, is I wanted a red macaw. And this is a real macaw that I photographed in a zoo in Nassau who lives with blue and yellow macaw, so I had to you know, take my pick here. This is one piece of red fabric, including the feet, okay? Remember the old one piece idea? I went through with it. I used my colored pencils and I drew basically, maybe not all of the leaves, but principally most of the leaves that I wanted to do here and shaded them so I knew, you know, kind of had an idea what I wanted to do. Later, I just stuck in the blue in here and found a fabric for the tail, which was a lighter find. And this is a lighter portion of this, um, I think it's a batik I was using or whatever this fabric was, but it definitely looks like a separate orange piece. But I did make sure that I had one red piece here, including the feet and including the beak. I did not want to go back and have to applique down a separate piece for that beak and I didn't want to do so I, I told you this is going to be easy I had to keep it easy so here's how we keep it easy for the beak I got up my handy dandy markers that you saw in lesson one I used those for Fabri uh, those Fabrico brush ends and I drew in very dark black beak black as could be got it just as dark as I could be it was on top of the red fabric, so it took a lot of it. But then once I did that, then I started working with my white colored pencil, bringing up the highlights to show you that this was indeed, and, and they do, that's exactly what those beaks look like. They have these shiny areas on them. So I did that. I had already done all the stitching on here when I did that. And then I went down to his feet, and I said, all right, his feet were very, very red. It was the same fabric. And I took out my black and my brown markers, and I just kept drawing on this with markers. Never did another thing to get his little red, because I didn't think the feet were too important. Everything else was more important. And I tucked under that separate piece of a log that his feet are, are sitting on. I just kind of turned that under. 
I had already auditioned him on several backgrounds. I thought he was going to be on a wild plaid background. Instead, I found this wonderful, wonderful dark print. See all this dark print in here? And you have to understand, these leaves, I should come down here, I, I'm moving around too much maybe, but see these leaves in here? They were already in the fabric. And I thought, oh wow, I can work on it and capitalize on it. And what I did in the quilting then was I stitched around to bring them up. And you can see just the quilting that I did. You're getting a nice shot to see the quilting that I was doing. When you do an applique this large, and normally I know you don't, but when you do, this would pooch out on you if you didn't do some kind of quilting. So I did quilt around his wing. This is Beauregard, and I quilted around Beau's wing so that he wouldn't pooch out quite as much. And that, you quilters, you machine quilters understand that. I had every one of these elements as a separate element, as I've been showing you all along. And these were rejected leaves, you can tell, that I had that were going to be possibilities for the quilt that I wound up not using simply because I found that I had had enough. Now, I did sweat. I told you in the beginning you could use any kind of fabric you wanted, and I do. And this is linen, and I used it because it already had some of these lines in it. And I thought, oh, I can capitalize on this, and I can do this dark line on the side of the screen, and it will look like the kind of tropical leaves that parrots like to sit among. So I did that on linen, and then later I ran into one problem and I want you to understand that there's a solution to every problem we ever have and the solution was simply this. I didn't say this but I usually do use blanket stitches on my appliques because it's my th my stitch of choice. It may not be yours. You, you use yours. But I felt because this was linen, pokies, threads were poking out here. I, I was working on that side. Threads were poking out along here. And I thought, there has to be a way. There's always a way to fix it, right? So what I did is I got water-soluble see-through. I guess it's a stabilizer, yeah. Um, but it's the water-soluble see-through stuff that you melt in the water. It's one, one brand, one name is Solvi that will be familiar. And some of you use plain old plastic bags sometimes in your embroidery. And I found that if I cut a strip and put it along the edges, especially on the points, the points were just, I just had all kind of little sticky outies there, right? So I put it all along there, got a variegated, this is the one time I really liked this variegated thread here, just pinned it down and went to town. And if you do satin stitch, don't bunch it up too tight. You know, you can bunch it up too tight spread it apart a little bit, but because it had that water soluble stuff, I was able to sew that and I look at it now and I actually like it. I don't normally like my satin stitches. And then you just simply strip off the water soluble. I don't wash my quilts, but if the kids got peanut butter on here, I'd have to wash it. So that would wash out, but the pokies wouldn't come back. But I just pulled it off and I can now finally show this to people without hanging my head and saying, this is a satin stitch. I simply arranged every element on here. Everything was a separate element, and I just kept arranging it until I found where I wanted. And I decided to put some wild borders on it and let some things come out. And when you're composing appliques, stick some things over if you want, stick some things out. It's your quilt. You love it, and you'll enjoy it. So that summarizes fairly well this whole idea that I've been working with, with bodacious applique because it's, you know, you got to admit, it's rather bold. I hope you think it's beautiful. It's a great deal of fun. If you want to learn more of uh, some additional minor types of, of uh, applique or do any of the quilts you've seen shown, yes, I'm very proud to say that the American Quilter Society published my book and it is called Bodacious Applique a la carte. And of course, I wouldn't mind if you bought it. I hope you've enjoyed this. I have had a blast. And if you need to get in touch with me, uh, you'll get my email and I answer every email I ever get. So thank you so much for participating in this program. And thank you to the university for making it possible because quilters love quilters, don't we? Again, thank you.